Packer Show. And welcome into the Back Row Pack Show. I'm Aaron Yakel, and sitting alongside me is your co-host, Ben Ullman. Thanks for joining us tonight for episode three, otherwise known as the Tony Canadeo episode. Tonight, we are more than pleased to have Jay Andrews. You can find him on Twitter at UPJ33 from Town Brawl. His co-host, by the way, new co-host, the one and only Super Bowl champion, Brandon Jackson, at BJackson32 on Twitter. How the heck are you guys? I'm doing awesome. Thanks for having me, guys. Pleasure pleasure to be here. I'm doing good, too, Aaron. Uh, been a pretty in- eventful week for the Packer fans, and can't wait to get into that. Yeah, something went down this weekend, guys. After months of what seems like months of just sitting at home staring at the walls, we had something live to do with sports, and it feels like the whole world tuned in. That little thing was the NFL draft. What was your initial thoughts of just being able to experience something live, Jay? Uh, well, let, uh, let's put it like this. Uh, my life is routine driven. And so when I was, you know, got done with work, I literally stayed to my routine, but replaced all my daily work stuff with football stuff. So it's been film study, uh, making videos, prospect primers. And so to me, the enjoyment of the draft is I actually, it's less work for me. It's sitting there writing all 255 draft picks and where they came from and the team in which they went and the trades that happened and all that stuff in a notebook, and that's my work. There's I stay off of pretty much social media after the first round. I read some stuff, but it's just concentrating on the draft and any of the prospects I feel like I, I need to make side notes to go watch film on. I put them in a different notebook. That's not my draft note. So it's it's relaxation and enjoyment and that's what i looked forward to the draft it's actually less work if that makes any sense it's the enjoyment of all the work that i've been putting up with absolutely in fact the staying off the twitter or reading the comments after round one was probably smart there was quite a few enraged should should we say comments coming in ben how was your draft watching uh, it actually it went pretty good here uh it's been just a long time of not seeing anything new happening and being kind of locked up. It was nice that they actually had a way to make it go down and not have to postpone it. I actually am on the opposite side of that. I really liked the way the draft unfolded. Very good, very good. So before the draft, obviously our first two episodes, Ben and I had discussed what we would like to see happen, maybe what our expectations were. and. You know, of course, the general public wanted to see that wide receiver splash pick. You know, if you mentioned or if you remember back to our first couple episodes, when we laid out a, a possible scenario, we weren't even coming up with a wide receiver till round three with, you know, the likes of an offensive tackle or or middle linebacker in round two. When we got to the real thing, Jay, round one. Quarterback Jordan Love out of Utah State with running back A.J. Dillon following up in round two. What were your initial thoughts as we possibly see the quarterback of the future and depending on how it plays out, the running back of the future? First of all, the Jordan Love thing. All right, here's the thing about the Jordan Love thing. I actually ended up staying up and being dog tired on day two of the draft because I was up until 5, 530 catching up because I was so set on ignoring the what I thought was a smoke screen for another year. Uh, I had all kinds of reasons that I had I laid out on my show, Title Town Brawl, you know, for why they wouldn't be doing it this year and all this stuff. And so I had literally not paid attention to Jordan Love. I did a prospect primer on him and a little video, that, and that was the highlights, but not not watching the 2018 tape, the full games and all that stuff to actually know him, right? Because it's it's a smoke right. screen. Why why am I wasting my attention? You know. So when it when they traded up, right, and then the pick came in, my response, excuse my language, was exactly, "Holy shit, what just happened?" Not mad. <laughs> not I wasn't mad, guys, but just like 
I was shocked. It actually I, I was happened. Shocked. I'm not like I. I've had some angry picks. I was mad when they picked Dayton Jones. I was mad when they picked Nick Perry. I've been mad when they've picked other players. I wasn't mad this time. It was just literally the shock of they didn't just do that. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So you guys are obviously old enough to have been cognizant of everything happening in football when the Packers had to plan for the future and replace Brett Favre in an early fashion. Do you think, you know, obviously different players, different going out in the twilight of the career, so to speak, do we see a smooth transition? And do you like how, if it works, how the Packers seem to bring in that heir apparent early to have them sit behind and learn from the guy that's there. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a little teaser and then I'm going to let your co-host go. I'm going to make this quick. We're going to address this a lot. And and my co-host Brandon Jackson has a lot of insight on this. And, and I will tell you this much as a teaser. First of all, do not expect a rod to, to treat this guy the way he was treated and he'll get into more detail of why. Second of all, this is not necessarily the same thing for a couple of reasons, including they didn't sit and this guy fell to them by chance. They attacked it, and that Mike Sherman was not on board with getting Aaron Rodgers. Matt LaFleur wanted Justin, or you know, he, he wanted Jordan Love. Okay, not just the GM. There's, so that's, there's a couple of key things here that set that up, but Aaron is is not as snarky as you think. He just isn't. There's a lot of surface stuff there that is just that, surface stuff. I will tell you that much, and I'm learning a lot more the more I get to talk to B-Jack. It just, it's just he's been in that locker room, right. right? He was personally responsible. That was his job to protect him on third downs, and he took it very seriously from the conversations I've had with him in the, in, in the four or five days. So... I, I don't know what you think about, but I will tell you this. It was shocking, but there is no reason to think that this was done because they're trying to run him out of town. That's hot take, and all the guys out there doing it are doing it for the reason they're, they got a job to do. They have right. things to sell. Right. I, I do think a lot of the, the vitriol seeking is just to get the, the listens and, and whatnot. Ben, what are your initial thoughts as we're a couple days removed from the pick? Um, I actually, I enjoyed the pick even kind of at the time I was a little, little shocked, but hearing the things that there was, they had pretty good knowledge that a team early second round was trying to trade up for him as well. I mean, they really liked him. They wanted to get it done. There were reports that when he came in for his interview, he talked more about the mistakes he made in 2019 and how he wanted to get better than the success he had in 2018. It showed that he wanted to get better over gloating about his success that he had in 2018. I like the pick. I think it's good that he's going to have the time to sit there. He'll do nothing but learn sitting on the bench watching Aaron Rodgers play. Yeah, one of the things I've been saying, you know, pretty much since the night of the pick is the fact that they did move up to get him. Though it shocked some people, I kind of felt that even Tennessee might have been in that market. You know, the the Ryan Tannehill isn't long for this world, so they're going to need to address that sooner or later. One of those teams, like you said, either them or in the early second round, definitely had the writing on the wall to grab Jordan Love. And if he is the one that you want, why not have the luxury of getting him versus being forced into that pick in a couple of years when you don't really know what's coming coming up down the line? Well, guys, I'll ask you the question that that B-Jack asked me and asked me every time I bring this subject up. He starts out by asking me, what would you do if you had the opportunity to draft? Because, and and before I finish that, who is is this guy the scout's talking about? This could be potentially the next who. Who are they comparing him to? Patrick Mahomes. Yeah. They were saying that he he's got the arm talent, the best. They were saying the best arm talent in the draft, right? Not not the best prospect, not the most polished. That was Joe Burrow, but Joe Burrow is going to have a lot of interceptions 
in the league if he throws the balls he was throwing. You watch his highlight package, Justin Jefferson, short ball, making a catch, a, a Randy Moss catch over the guy. That's getting intercepted by Pro Bowl DBs, guys. Yes, he's more polished, he's more accurate, but his arm strength, his arm talent is is not top 10 in this draft class, not top 5. He's just a more accurate, more polished, better decision maker, more pro ready in that mind. Everybody talked about this guy being the best, and they started throwing out the Patrick Mahomes. So B-Jack asked me, what would you do if you had the opportunity to draft the next Patrick Mahomes? What would you do? What would you do? You take that chance and you run with it. And what's your job as a GM? To do exactly that, right? It's not about to worry about the feelings of your two-time MVP, Super Bowl MVP, uh, future Hall of Fame quarterback. Because if he can't handle that, well, then, boy, we better question all the credentials I just listed off. Correct. You know, if <laughs> if accuracy is your one ding, why not sit behind one of, if not the most accurate quarterback in history? Learn from it, and I think it's he's going to just become better for it. But even today, guys, the biggest knock was it wasn't about accuracy because the accuracy thing was – wasn't it was decision making and is that coachable? Right. Can you fix that? I don't think decision making is like telling me that you've got sloppy footwork and that you can't like you can teach a kid how to make better decisions. If you cannot be taught how to be a better decision maker, boy, you would you wouldn't even be in the college ranks. I hate to tell all the people using that as an excuse of why this was a stupid pick. Like that's a stupid caveat of why it was a dumb pick. Sorry. Like, that's one of the worst. That's like telling me an outside linebacker is 15 pounds too light when he can only be in college practicing in the weight room 20 hours a week. If that's your knock on the kid, i.e. Brandon Burns last year, if that's the only issue you can tell me is he's 235 instead of 250 like I'd want him to be, get out of here with that stuff. Come on. You know, these scouts that do that, like, it's that's laziness. That's the, just truth. Sorry. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. That's kind of what I was seeing uh, watching film of his last year with the interceptions. It was more of a decision-making example, Brett Favre, over accuracy. Late late across the middle, no, and the ball is there, but it's a good play on the DB who's already breaking on the ball because he sees his eyes and he's late. Yeah, because that, that was even Brett Favre. He threw a million interceptions, but it wasn't because he wasn't accurate. It's because he didn't, he didn't make a good decision. He truly felt every receiver was open because he could make the throw. And and you hear Jordan Love talk about it, and he already says it right away. I was trying to do too much. I can make better decisions. Exactly. Oh, oh so now you're telling me that the kid already is self-aware of his faults? Yeah. Come on. And, and you can oh, come on with that. Like, it, look, I understand why people are mad, but I tried to tell people, guys, I, I got around to it. Because I was a year early. I tried to say last year studying uh, studying this team uh, and its draft MO and then studying Matt LaFleur of where he came from and trying to anticipate his offense, I didn't see them having the roster and playing the way they did. But here's the mistake I made, and it's my bad. Like most things in sports, when you're transitioning, he, he had a quarterback that's the incumbent, right? And the incumbent was brought up in a system for 13 years. So you can't take and just throw out everything in one year that you're incumbent Hall of Fame. So there was a marriage of 50% Lafleur and 50% of McCarthy that Lafleur could intertwine into his overall without screwing up the teaching abilities. So it, he was smart. He get, he should get more credit for last year's coaching job, regardless of what it looked like, because he had to take half of his playbook and just kind of leave it to the side and try to figure out how to get all this McCarthy stuff that he's not going to use intertwined into and teach that to young players at the same time telling them, you know, these techniques – are going to transition out of this certain play in this formation, but we're going to use it in this way later, and that's going to be our stable of that play. That's You know how difficult that is for a 39-year-old head coach with no experience and all that stuff? He did a good job. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, the proof was in the pudding there. Not, not one Packer fan could be disappointed with what happened last year. Not to sell the first pick short, but round two saw what some are saying was the, if you couldn't get Jonathan Taylor, you couldn't get DeAndre Swift, why not take 
Jonathan Taylor Light or the poor man's Henry, you know, the, the former beast that LaFleur had in Tennessee. If the Lightning is Aaron Jones, how much thunder can A.J. Dillon provide in this offense? A.J. Dillon, honestly, could potentially be a better back than Aaron Jones. Because the one thing that Aaron Jones cannot do is pound it for the one yard when everybody knows he's there. He, he can do it. He's got a nose for the end zone, don't get me wrong, and he can get it congested. But why is he not on the field? He's a star running back, so why in, in fourth and one or third and short, why is it Jamal Williams brought in, and but in they keep him there in the goal lines? Because there's extra motivation at the goal line, and he's got a knack that he just doesn't have in the open field outside of that. And I don't, I can't explain it. I, I don't, I just, that's what it is on film. AJ Dillon just didn't get opportunities to catch the ball. He didn't get opportunities to show that he, just like, remember what everybody said about Derrick Henry? Well, yeah, but he can't catch the ball and that frame and this and that, and he can't get going and he's not going to be successful. And another. Well, they just didn't give him those opportunities at Alabama. And guess what? We're finding out that he can do all that stuff. He, I think you're going to find out A.J. Dillon can do all that stuff. And does it marry the, the guys I thought? This whole draft didn't marry the guys I thought. But I've studied this team, and I can understand what they're doing, why they're doing, and how they're going to execute and go about it. And I don't have to agree with it, and none of us do. But damn it, you better get on board with it. Or as fans, you're going to be P-I-S-S-E-D for a long time because it's not changing. This is the new guard. This is what it's going to be. They're not going to – four receivers, they don't need them. They don't value wide receivers. They don't value running backs. They don't value – middle linebackers in Green Bay, and this offense and defensive coaches don't either, and the front office don't, and it's a marriage, and those positions, they're not happening. You know what they value? Edge rushers, corners, linemen, quarterbacks, tight ends. Controlling the game through true athletes, exactly. Ben, any thoughts on Dylan? I I did. uh, I really did like the Dylan pick. Um, I did run down kind of in our last episode that I think we needed to get a running back early. I don't think Aaron Jones is going to be there after this coming year. He's going to be that odd man out with the contracts. I think A.J. Dillon fits Matt LaFleur's offense better. Uh, he's 247 pounds, ran a 4.53. That's moving for somebody that size. He had 4,300 yards. Why, why would you throw the ball to him when he's averaging 5.2 yards a carry? Just hand the ball to him. You can't mess that up. 38 touchdowns over three years. I think A.J. Dillon's going to be the real real deal. He'll be starting not this coming season. He'll split with Aaron Jones. But I think second season after, he'll be starting. Aaron Jones will be on his way out because I think he's going to demand Christian McCaffrey kind of money. So. Well, and I think they'll utilize all these guys. And, and people are forgetting the six-round pick last year that – uh, if they weren't high on him, he never made it to practice squad, if you don't remember, and he never made it much other than a few games. He was always on the uh, 53, but always deactivated for the 48 game day guys. But they wouldn't get rid of him. They didn't replace him. They made a lot of roster moves, but Dexter Williams stuck around. And why? Because can you imagine, do, you, do you know what Dexter Williams has that all the other guys that they have don't? The other Jamal Williams doesn't have it. Jones doesn't have an A.J. Dillon doesn't. He literally watch him and his film and what they love about him. In this zone stretch system, he is the perfect guy to kill you with speed. He will stick his foot in the ground, make the backside cut, and he's gone. He is gone, guys. If you watch his tape from and why they drafted him, he would have been a late second, early third round pick had he not had character issues and some issues with his character in college that knocked him down to the sixth round. His tape is is very much Chris Johnson. He's not a pounder. He's he's even slight. He's smaller. But he sticks his foot in the ground, and you ain't got contact on him, and he gets two steps, you're not catching. He's he's gone. He's 60 to the house. Yeah. Watching him at at Notre Dame, when, when he was drafted last year, my initial pick was Jamal Williams is, is seeing the door. I figured he'd come in right away, be the, the second behind Aaron Jones. What – I did hear rumblings of last year was he was not necessarily able to pick up the pass pro as quickly as they had hoped. 
But like you said, they did stick him around. But he had problems finding the hole too. He he had some issues finding the backside cut and making the right reads even on the front side, you know, because the zone, that's what people don't understand. The zone scheme doesn't give you a defined hole. It's we're running inside zone. It's, you know, we're going to the garden center. I have this blocking combination. You have to make the right read based on the leverage of the defense, whether to go left or right of that guard combination block. It's not one. It's choices. On the outside stretch, there can be three or four holes created, and if all three of those hold four front side, usually that means you have to stick your foot in the ground and have the vision and be able to hit the backside cut. That's what they're talking about. And so he has problems finding that in the right timing, and it's why, but boy, like I said, what kept him there was those one times when he did find it, he's, he's gone even in practice. And you go, yeah, we can't let him go to the practice squad. He, he, we're not going to have him around. you know. And, and so when that clicks, so think 49ers this year with their run game. All four of these backs are going to stay around. Don't get into this stuff. Other pundits are going to tell you that they're going to trade one and there's going to be these issues. No, they're all on rookie deals. They can afford them all. They're not, they're not the type of an organization that's going to let, you know, if somebody wants to hold out, well, that's they can't control that. But they're, it would be not be in their best interest for their plan to move on from any of these guys because they're all different, just like the 49ers backs were all different, and that's what they want to do. They they It's ball control, Adams and Rodgers for third down, and anybody else that steps up, Sternberger and the new kid as your tight end stable and whoever out, Tanyan, hopefully. You're running the ball, grinding it out with these different four backs, and Aaron Rodgers breaks Drew Brees' completion percentage record for a freaking season and probably does it in probably 150 less passes because it'll be ball control. And he might not be always happy, and they might always win games again. We're probably going to hear a lot of, oh, they won games ugly. But who gives a crap? Put rings on your finger, and I don't care how you do it. Very true. So you mentioned the new kid, perceived passing help that everybody was seeking in this draft. Tight end Josiah DeGuara. And I'm going to be honest with you. He wasn't very high on the tight ends that I knew anything about. About the only thing I knew about Josiah was that he went to the same school as Travis Kelsey. Though post pick, once I looked into him a little bit, I can see somebody that can pretty much play all over the field, which Matt LaFleur is going to love. You remember the end of last year, you saw Sternberger playing fullback and anything that was asked of him, he was doing. And I can see DeGuara doing the same thing and stretch the field with a a deep burning pass. What are you guys seeing, uh, Jay? He, like an H-back. He's more than an H-back. They just, that's that's kind of... Everybody has to have some sort of they they literally pick these guys and if you if you're like a geek enough like I am you're still up at one o'clock in the morning when they're having these live press conferences and they literally have to have a comp from a hundred different press conferences and all these answers and they just got done with all this stressful stuff so I think it's funny that we like to take certain statements and just run with it and just go get in f- frenzy about it yes they use the word H back. But they didn't draft a third-round H-back. Get real. I mean, can we stop with the stupidity that we treat these guys with because we don't <laughs> agree with what they do? Like, the minute we don't like something they do, they're, I'll fire them. They're the dumbest person ever. They have no idea what they're doing. Oh. Oh, okay. Right. Because just every – it just so, like, yeah, he said the words, but – He's more than that. They, they, he's versatile. He can do all those things an H back can do. But you know, he did something that Travis Kelsey didn't do. And Travis Kelsey's damn good tight end. He had a thousand yards plus at, as a receiving tight end. Right. That's more than an H back, guys. Don't get stuck on the phrase. Yeah, I do. I do like that uh, tight end. He's uh, pretty quick for a tight end. He's going to line up as an H back. He's going to line up on the line. He can also play the slot. When you have somebody his size blocking from the slot. That's basically another offensive lineman lined up out on the edge. This team is going to be built around tight ends. You're going to have him, Sternberger, Tanya will still be around, and then Mercedes Lewis. You're going to have a lot of big bodies on the field to be running the ball, short ball control, like Jay was saying. I think it's going to be fun to watch. The Packers did not have a fourth round, as they used that to move up to get 
Jordan Love. But in the fifth round, they took a stab at a Big Ten out of Minnesota linebacker, Kamal Martin, at pick 175. The question remains, is he going to see early playing time at all, perhaps next to Kirksey, or are we going to be waiting perhaps a year to see quality production out of him? I don't know what they're going to do, but I'm going to tell you right now, that that's just one of those picks where it's it's an Oren Burks type pick. It's They saw him as an athletic guy that they can probably utilize, but they play the nickel and dime like 60-plus percent of the time. They played two defensive down linemen, one true linebacker, and an overhang hybrid linebacker defensive back. Like They, they don't value the wide receiver positions, why they didn't draft one again this year because of the young guys, and they don't value inside linebackers. So anybody they draft, it's just because they value him as something other than, yes, he can plug and play and be the next Navarro Bullman or Patrick Willis, which is every time we pick a middle linebacker, that's what we always want to know. Well, is he going to be the next Pro Bowl guy that has seven sacks and three? No. If they thought that he could do that, they would have went and drafted Patrick Queen or Kenneth Murray, who they could have done when they traded up. They don't value it. They don't care. It's not what they're looking at with this kid. I did have Kamal Martin in our pre-draft episode as a guy. I thought they'd be targeting around that time frame. Yeah, you were pretty proud of that pick when that came through, weren't you? I I was. I did text it right away when that came through. I'm like, hey, I said his name. I think he's going to be more involved on special teams right away. His tape shows problems of diagnosing lanes. He's not that great of a coverage guy. I think he'll see early and often work on special teams. Uh, The coach will have to work him up on a decent playing time on the defensive side of the ball. Round six saw the offensive line get some help with pick 192, John Runyon out of Michigan, pick 208, center Jake Hansen out of Oregon, and 209, Simon Stepanakert out of Indiana. You know, when, you, when you get down to, to round six and seven, there it is. I was going to practice that too. <laughs> you know, round six and seven, you you start seeing you know the percentages dip down into are they you know camp bodies or just fodder for the guys that are actually going to make the team. What are your feelings on these uh, offensive line, the three guys? Do we see any future for them? Uh, you know, the Big Ten guys I'm aware of, but the Oregon guy, I, you know, West Coast bias, I'm not seeing much of them, of course. But what are you guys seeing? I think the uh, you can't really ever go wrong with offensive linemen. Late round offensive linemen seem to turn into things better than other positions. I'm not going to knock them ever for taking an offensive lineman like we've seen John Runyon play because we're in the Big Ten watching the Badgers. He always looks good, but that is against college D linemen. College D linemen in the Big Ten are usually a little bit better than the rest of the college and take it to SEC. But I'm not going to bash him for any offensive lineman. Like Gunakun said, he was high on some wide receivers that were in the first round. After that, he didn't feel any of them made his team better. Offensive lineman, just you're going to get what you get out of an offensive lineman. They're big body. Can you teach them to move to the NFL level? Yeah, for me, Runyon is everybody loves him. You watch him; he he's going to be a starter on this line somewhere. I whether it's center or guard, uh, he is a future center or guard starter on on this team. The other two guys, they're going to make a run at at positions, whether it be swing tackle or or backup guys or pushing for starting positions. Uh, but Runyon, he's definitely a guy that this year, I, I would say that's probably at some point going to see some significant playing time. He's good enough. And and with some pro, pro development, he's going to get better. He's definitely a guy that uh, was. I was surprised he was around in the sixth round. I mean, he's a lot better of a lineman than you'd expect to be seeing in a sixth round availability kind of thing. So that was that was a pleasant surprise that they picked him up and you, you kind of look into his tape and what his value is. Not a tackle, don't get me wrong, so I'm not saying he's going to be the answer for Wagner. That is the one thing that did make me shake my head because I am a firm believer that none of these guys are future tackle guys, but if any of these guys, including Cole Madison, can push for the guard spot, 
there may be a chance that Ricky Wagner is not is still the swing tackle and that Turner at eight and a half million dollars who can play tackle or or even though he's an all pro he's athletic and damn good enough and, and did play tackle he played all the positions except for right tackle in college in, in Alton Jenkins so you do not know and and just because what we saw last year was worked we don't know with that many linemen being drafted and the different skill sets of them all being inside guys, if one or more of them hit, including Cole Madison coming into his third season, you don't know what the five offensive line uh, combination is going to look like other than probably the incumbent at center for one more year and Bakhtiari. That, it is intriguing when you have that many guys you draft because linemen are the one things I, I kind of throw the round out. you got to pay attention to the tape and where they're projected, and then they're going to get better coaching. They're going to get better for the most part. So that was intriguing, and that really does tell you what they're, they're focused on, controlling the line of scrimmage. Just further, further just kind of down patterns on where this team is heading offensive scheme-wise. And you can get those diamonds in the rough out of the late rounds. What round was Bakhtiari? Four. Very good. Round seven saw us end with safety Vernon Scott out of TCU and edge rusher Jonathan Garvin out of Miami. I'm going to be honest here again, guys. The tape on these two individuals has not been watched by my eyes yet, so I have nothing to add. Ben, have you gotten there? I looked at it a little bit, I think, as we get on a little bit. Further here, I think that safety probably isn't even the best safety that we added. As for edge, I think we mix and match and seeing who can spell the Smiths every once in a while, but they're going to be ruling the edge just like they did last year. I think Rashawn Gary will get in there a little bit more. Uh, safety, he's got he's a, he's a lot to be desired. Um, guy that's probably more of a camp body practice squad dude than really anybody that they're high on as as a this year guy but where he's picked those types of dudes are more of what their athletic raw athleticism is than what they can be as football players so now garvin should have been a third round pick should have been a fourth round pick at the latest he is going to be he is way better right now today than kyla fackrell is pure and simple he he is edge rusher four and I don't think it'll be too hard for him to solidify that spot. And he will stand up. He will be an outside back, outside backer. Uh, he can put his hand in the dirt, and then some of these little packages and stuff, he will be a rotational player there. But just as, as far as just being able to stand up on a third down and be a rotational number four outside linebacker, either left or right side, yeah, I think it'll be pretty easy for him to walk in camp, barring an injury, and just just. Go get him. He might have some problems where they don't want him dropping or whatever, but he just go get the quarterback on third down. Yeah, he's he's much better than the round in which he was taken. And I think there was something to do with some injuries and a few other reasons of, of why he was around there. But yeah, you turn on his tape and you're like, no, that's not a six round talent. That's it's kind of laughable. He's there. He's he's a he's definitely a steal of of that round in in what this team needs. Yeah, you put his hand up and. He, he's better than Fackrell. Don't worry. He's not going to give you headaches like Fackrell did. He can. He's actually got some pass rush moves, and he knows what the hell he's doing. It's not just, oh, I was on block so I can get a sack today. You have definitely excited me to go watch that. I loved everything you said about him, and I hope he does stick around for all of that. And, of course, with the draft ending, you always do get the undrafted free agents getting, getting an added and – perhaps with the Packers in recent history, making a statement on their play and sticking around for the 53-man roster. And, guys, I'm going to run through these names, and if you have anyone that we'd like to circle back on, let me know. Uh, We did see the first wide receiver of the the draft season get added in Darrell Stewart out of Michigan State. Lowerke, he's got Stewart! Another edge, Delonte Scott out of SMU. Henry Black, defensive back out of Baylor. Travis Bruffy, uh, offensive lineman, Texas Tech. Jordan Jones, tight end out of Prairie View. Wilmington Prevalon, defensive end out of Rutgers. 
Patrick Taylor, running back for Memphis. Stanford Samuels, cornerback for Florida State. Tupa Galea, defensive end, Utah State. Mark Antoine DeCoy, defensive back, Canada. Zach Johnson, offensive lineman, North Dakota State. Chris Barnes, linebacker, USC, UCLA. And Will Sunderland, the defensive back out of Troy. Any names other than the fact that the wide receiver stands out? Anything sticking out for you guys? I do have one that I think we will see make it past camps and will be on the opening day roster. I think Mark DeCroix from the College of Montreal out of Canada. He's going to be something to watch. His pro day, he ran a 4-3-5. Uh, there was only one safety out of the 49 guys that were at the combine that ran faster than that. His three cone was a 6-6-5. Nobody even came close to that. And only 11 of the safeties actually broke seven seconds. Four guys bettered his vertical of 37. And six jumped further than his broad jump of 10 foot 8. He's a bigger bigger guy in safety standards. Um, he's a little over six feet tall. And all of that at his pro day came on being very sick. He was to the point where he didn't think he was going to even be able to do any of that. He put up those kind of numbers. Daryl Stewart. He was decent at Michigan State. He got a problem with drops. He's a bigger slot guy at six foot. Decent at blocking. His routes are pretty nothing spectacular. But the one guy that I'd be watching is DeQuad out of Canada. Yeah, and the guy that I am going to, I'm not, I didn't get to him yet, but because of the school he's at, is the running back Patrick Taylor out of Memphis. And the reason why is that one that stuck out to me and why I want to go watch his tape and really get into his skill set and kind of see how he tested and all that kind of stuff is because Memphis ran a very, very unique style of offense. A lot of that wildcat, it's a lot of motions and jet sweeps, a lot of gadgety stuff, you know, so they really utilized a lot of their receivers, quarterbacks, and running backs in a lot of multiple ways. And so he intrigues me right away just seeing that he's a running back for Memphis. And I haven't gotten there yet, so you know I'll keep you guys in, in tune with what I find on him. But that one, because of the offense they run, he he's the one that jumps out of me and intrigues me because I think right away when I hear him, I immediately think of could he be a better version of a version or replacement for uh, Tyler Irvin? who is that kind of guy that came from an offense where he can be utilized in a lot of gadgety type ways. That's one that I, I think we should pay attention to because they do want to do that. They use that even as smoke and mirrors, just those motions to keep you kind of honest in what you're trying to do. You can't disguise if there's motions coming <laughs> back and forth and your defense has to move around to get guys in the right alignment. So that one intrigues me the most. Rounding out the episode, guys, let's go move into something we like to call just items off the Twitters. A lot of these today are great follows that I get a lot of the information from, you know, specifically on Rogers versus Love. Ken Ingles, Packers cap at Ken Ingles on Twitter, tweeted that the decisions with Rogers are rather simply laid out in 2022. One, keep Rodgers with a cap hit of $40 million with cheap Jordan Love on the bench. Two, trade Rodgers, free up $22.65 million of cap space while taking $17.2 million dead cap. Or three, trade Jordan Love and start the QB search over. As we continue on with the you know, Packers as they go, I, I'd like to throw out three. Here's something else though, you have to consider. An option is take a zero cap penalty, don't have to trade Aaron Rodgers because he retires in two years. There is the hidden fourth option. Be- because people don't, don't, aren't thinking enough of why now? Why? And, and, and I asked B-Jack this specifically, and he answered me very simply, Neh. With a smile. And I said, why haven't we heard anything? No cryptic tweets. No, I'm okay. I'm mad. Now, he's talked to Jordan Love. We've heard from Jordan Love, and he said he was very nice to him. But 
when have we ever known when Aaron Rodgers doesn't like something or something shocks him or something he is, is going to be upset about, when have we not heard his opinion in some form? And it's crickets. And everybody wants to use the crickets as, oh, this is, means he's really mad. No, the smile I got from B-Jack is it's, he's mad in the same way he is still pissed to this day that he got embarrassed that he had to sit in the green room and wait until 24 to get in trade. He's mad because he already knows his name is going to get embarrassed that they're trying to push him out when he knows the plan because he's, he's iterated it and everybody's on the same page. Like, nobody's going to talk about it, but how do we know that just because he kept saying that, oh, I want to play till I'm 40, maybe last year, in the last couple of years of getting banged up and being with Danica Patrick and this quarantine and everything else is making him realize that I don't need to keep getting beat up until I'm 40. Like, I got two years that I really want to play and I know I can play well, and after that, you know what? Maybe it's time for me to walk away. And he could have said that privately, and that's why we're not hearing anything. There's a huge possibility of that. Right. You're, you're hearing a lot of the, uh, or at least I am, um, the, the, the memes or the jokes of, you know, the, the GMs that seek out perhaps an opinion of their quarterback, their team leader of who would you like us to, to get, you know, who can we help you with? And who's to say they didn't actually do that. That's kind of what I was thinking on that. That's, you look at the next two years, Aaron Rodgers wins the Super Bowl. He looks at it like, do I want to take the chance of breaking another collarbone? Do I want to take the chance of keep getting hit? He's got enough money. He's got his investments and in owning part of the box. He's set. At one point, he's going to be done getting beat up. People don't realize you watch. There's there's one thing that I, I will tell you that is different about Aaron Rodgers and all the differences and all the pundits and everything else. There's one noticeable difference in Aaron Rodgers from, from his second collarbone break, which was his throwing shoulder, which he has a steel plate with 14 screws so that it can never break again. And you know what it did? It changed his throwing motion. And, and it took him a while to get a lot of his accuracy and his velocity back, and he's still the same Aaron Rodgers, but his throwing motion's a little different. And I bet you, and I'm going to tell you this, guys, we all wake up. I'm 36. I don't know how old you guys are, but we all wake up just from day-to-day life at our <laughs> age a hell of a lot sore than we did from those same activities when we were 20. And can you imagine what it's like for him? When you practice and like B Jack told me, do you realize that you just because you're injured as fans, as analysts that to us, oh, they're up in the training room. The training room is, he said, worse because you don't get breaks. So you never get a chance to uh, ice and elevate the way us people at home when we get a boo boo and it's, oh, honey, beat me some ice and we're laid up on the couch for two. No, that's not an athlete. So you don't, you know, like. All that has to be taken in consideration, guys, here, of, of somebody that has more than once in the last, what, 18 months, at least four times, I can see the back nine of my career. And we all assume because of the way his contract was done that it's that means it's, oh, he's playing his contract. Guys, the contract was done and restructured for what purpose? To extend the health of the cap. Stop reading into the length of the money of his because it goes away when you retire. It doesn't get accelerated to the cap. He retires tomorrow, they don't owe anything against the cap. That money goes, psh. now if he walked back in, it gets you know accelerated to whatever. But the day he retires, the, his cap, savings, penalty, doesn't mean jack squat. To round this thought out, I, I wanted to throw in this one here too. It this is from Zach Cruz at Zach Cruz too. The Packers probably didn't increase their chances of winning next year's Super Bowl tonight, round one of the draft, but they bought a lottery ticket that, if it hits, will mean 10 to 15 more years of high-level quarterback play in a city that has known nothing but high-level quarterback play for a quarter century. My initial, my very first football memory as a child was pretending to be Mikowski on the playground. So I have lived through my football knowledge this 25 years of the the high-level quarterback play, and I would love nothing more than for that uh, lottery ticket to hit home. 
Guys, every Packer media coverage person, including myself, ex-players, and every one of us Packer fans, including myself, and I'm both still, trust me, it's a struggle to this day. What's our number one fear up until this? What was the number one thing in the back of our minds every time Aaron gets hurt? Two things going through your mind immediately. Is the season no over because who's the backup quarterback? Oh, I think they might have solved that with this move, right? And, oh, my God, is it career ending? And what are we going to do now? Uh, we don't uh, – who, who, uh, which they could have just solved now. And everybody now thinks he's the stupidest GM that's ever lived. You can't have it every which different way, guys. They just solved all of our nightmares – from two different scenarios with one move, and it cost them a fourth-round pick to do it, and everybody's freaking out. Does it make any sense? I don't think so. Ben, any thoughts on the quarterback situation? I don't uh, I don't get why everyone's losing their mind either. Um, I'm all for it. Get that guy in line so that we don't have to turn into the Bears. Or the Lions. Or the Lions. Or the Browns or Vikings too. <laughs> I do not want to live through a Twitter experience if the Green Bay Packers go from Brett Favre to Aaron Rodgers to Brady Quinn and uh, uh, Jake DeLome and uh, Josh McCown. And are you freaking kidding me? Are you freaking kidding me? Don't want to be alive for that experience. Sorry, folks. No offense to everybody out there. We have been spoiled, that is for sure. And this move could save us all from having to do that. So just be thankful for just for once, just be thankful. They might have just done the right thing again. Again. Speaking of the right thing, I'm not drafting a wide receiver. Rob Domofsky of ESPN, of course, at Rob Domofsky. Tweeted, so in a nutshell, here's why Brian Gutekunst didn't take a receiver. He said early in the draft, they couldn't get high enough to take one of the top guys. And then in the middle, he didn't think there was anybody who could make an impact on our roster this year. Then he rattled off Al Nazard, Equinemius St. Brown, Devin Funches, MVS, Malik Taylor, and CFL signee Reggie Bagleton, among others, as guys pushing for playing time in production. To me, if this is truly what he tried to do, it did, you know, he tried to move up to get those impact players, if their war rooms really didn't have the grades for the, the middle-tier guys, I'm all for the smart drafting, of course, if it all plays out. Jay, do you believe he's just placating us, or is that really where he was at? <sighs> I'm going to tell you, there, there's a couple of parts to this. He did BS everybody, guys. They didn't try to move up for no damn wide receiver, impact wide receiver. That's him trying to caveat and being a smart uh, general manager, knowing what the fans want, because he cannot get up there and say he did not try and he doesn't care. Because guess what? He didn't try and he doesn't care. All right? <laughs> I tried to tell people this before. All right? But he's, he, that's the BS. The truth of the, his statement is in the, the reason why he didn't try, even though he lied that he did, is because of the guys he named. If, if we all had were forced to uh, turn in all of our social media handles forever because of uh, any time we made an absolute stupid ass of ourselves, no social media would be dead in Packer World. Because... We all wanted to cut Devontae Adams in after year two. 22 drops. Get rid of him. All these guys, other than EQ, who was injured last year, NVS, bunch of drops this year. Couldn't do it. Lost the quarterback's trust. We want to get rid of him. You know, uh, Lazard. Yeah, he had a good year, but he, Lazard going into his third year. EQ, MVS, third year. Devin Funches. There is a reason why the Colts gave him $10.5 million to be a receiver last year. He got hurt, but he's a six-year vet who's not even 26 yet. Came into the league at 19, turned 20 shortly, beginning of the season, much like Kenny Clark. Okay, 
oh, he's not a burner. He's more of a tight end. Turn on his film. He's, he runs routes about 80% as good as Devontae Adams. And, and with somebody's chasing him, he's a lot like Donald Driver. You're not going to catch him, but he's not that fast. Go ahead and try to catch him. That's a, he's, a, he's a good quality receiver. And he's never played with a quarterback as consistent throwing the ball as Aaron Rodgers. Never. Not even close. His best quarterback was Cam Newton, whose best year was 61%. An anomaly. After that, he's 56% career passer. Okay. Reggie Bagleton was a really good receiver in the CFL. Tight end stat, Bill. Play action once more. Mitchell gunning deep once more. And Bagleton has it again. Reggie Bagleton, see you later. Touchdown. Is there anything that this guy can't catch? And we'll have to see what he turns out. My point is, is all this group of guys, if one or two of them hit in the manner in which the average receiver comes in and hits somewhere between year three and five, not years one and two, more, there's more Devontae Adams receivers running around the league that are on their second team or everybody wanted them gone and finally hit at the, you know, their, at the end of their rookie contracts or their second contracts than there are guys that were drafted highly like the, like the anomalies in Kelvin Johnson's and the, and the uh, Julio Jones's and the OBJ's that everybody thinks every receiver is. No, those guys are rare talents. They're not the average. They're not the, the rule in the NFL. And so, yes, and this offense, only 61% of the time, 11 personnel, which is, which is one back, you know, three wide receivers. It's going to be less than 50% this year. So why do we need all the wide receivers? Why are we worried about it? I actually had talked about that in our last uh, episode, and I'm actually pretty high on Devin Funches. Um, I think by the end of this season, he's going to be the clear-cut number two, opposite of Devontae Adams. Everybody remembers his 4-7, 40 from the combine, which was an anomaly because he ran a 4-5-2 in his pro day. He's got speed for his size, even his film shows that. And like you said, these other guys are in the third year. Most receivers don't break out until that three- to five-year range. St. Brown was hurt all last year. I think the Packers staff has a lot of faith that he's going to be what they think he can be and then mvs still has that speed they're going to split time as that third fourth with alan lazard i don't see any problem going into camp with the receivers we have on the staff i know there's some people you listen to espn how did they not draft a wide receiver they didn't have a wide receiver that went over a thousand yards well how long was Devonte adams hurt that's why we didn't have a receiver that didn't go over a thousand yards yeah and he was still close that's just like telling me that the year before he went over a thousand yards, that the year that he had Brett Hundley for most of it, for nine games, and he had uh, twelve touchdowns and nine hundred and ninety-seven yards. Well, Devontae Adams isn't a top five or top three receiver because he didn't get three more yards. Shut up! Shut up! He had Brett Hundley. He had twelve touchdowns and nine hundred and ninety-seven yards with Brett Hundley. Shut up! ridiculous i you know, i don't know look there's it's there's a lot to do about nothing here and again i didn't i didn't see it this way i didn't agree with it i didn't i still look at it and go i have questions and things i disagree with but like my pic partner in crime b jack get on board it's different in green bay and if you're not going to get on board you're going to have a hard time because it's not going back the mccarthy era is done it's over it's gone the offense is not going to look anything like you're used to, and you better get used to it. And they're telling you that, and it's it's not just the coach. The you know Mark Murphy let the GM and his coach work together and do their thing. He's let his hands off, and this is what the two of them have decided. And guess what? Oh, I'm not. I'm not even going to throw the third in here. By the way, guys, this is also a complete team building because. If you control the ball and you you put the – instead of building the entire offense the way Mark M- Mike McCarthy did around Aaron Rodgers and putting all the illness on him making throws and, and these killer reads and second reaction plays the way he always had to, and guess what? This is not focused around Aaron Rodgers. Do you know what Aaron Rodgers' only responsibility really in this offense is? When they call the play action to complete the big play – 
for the explosiveness of the of it, which guess what? What who's one of the best explosive throwers in the NFL history? It's Aaron Rodgers, right? Aaron Rodgers. So you're playing to one of his strengths, right? Secondly, the illness and the, the most important thing of Aaron Rodgers' job that the, he is going to be coached on and they are going to put his 95% of his responsibility is going to be converting third downs, any third down. Because when the run game doesn't happen, it's going to be, all right, Aaron, you got third and 12, get us there so we can control the clock. And guess what? I don't think it's hard to, uh, hard a hard thing for us to say that he can be highly efficient at doing that, no matter whether it's in good third down situations or not, according to the stats. History tells me I've seen him do it a lot, take a sack on second and seven, and it'd be third and 14, and everybody freaking out, and he throws a 25-yard you know, strike and, and smiles and goes, yeah, see, that's why I took the sack, because I knew I could do that. And at, even at this age, he can still do that. And guess why that marries the team? Because what does Mike Patton not want to do? What has Mike Patton been on the podium four times last season and said, even after the NFC Championship game? Do you want to stop the run, Mike? Well, yeah, if we can stop the run, you know, within the defense in which we're employed, that's great. But you really, in this league, with the way the rules are set up, it's about stopping the passing game and the quarterback. Well, if you control the clock and you're grinding the, the game down, and you're dictating the tempo, guess what Mike Patton doesn't have to worry about scheming for week in and week out? Stopping the run because you're forcing the other team to pass the ball, right? Oh, so that doesn't that sound like maybe the three guys that are the most important in the organization are all on the same page and building a team and a scheme that complements what everybody in the building wants to do, and we all want to lose our shit over it? Come on, we're all idiots. Let's settle down. <laughs> that is the most truthful thing you've said all episode. We are all idiots. And I think this is going to be one year that we can all buckle up and enjoy the ride. And I can't think of a better way to end today's episode on all of the thoughts that you just said. Most importantly right now, I want to thank you, Jay, for coming on. And I'd like you to take the the podium here and tell our audience where they can find you, where they can hear more about you. And by all means, start plugging that partnership with Brandon Jackson. Well, of course you can hit me up on all my personal accounts on Twitter is at UPJ three, three on Instagram. It's J underscore Andrews. Oh, three, three on Facebook, search J Andrews. And then the show of course is title town brawl at title town brawl. And my new PIC and host with me of the show, Brandon Jackson, the Super Bowl champion running back from Nebraska that took us to Super Bowl 45 and helped bring home that title baby and he is at b jackson 32 on twitter and at brandon jackson 29 on instagram and hit us up also on instagram and on facebook by just searching title town brawl it's all the same follow like and share us our shows are live on the spreaker app tuesday and thursday evenings 8 p.m eastern time 7 p.m central 5 p.m west coast so if you're in drive time west coast turn us on man and all you got to do to listen to us live hit that speaker app download it it's free you follow title town brawl and it'll instantly tell you the minute we go live you listen to the link and you're right there and you can even chat with us on my board here on the mixing board live with us and always always on any social media platforms hit up the questions we got a segment we're doing at the end of every show. It's called Ask B Jack. You use the hashtag Ask B Jack on all your social media platforms, and we will get those in. Hit up your tags, shout you out, and answer your questions. Brandon will be doing that. You won't hear me talk too much unless you know he asks me. But Brandon Jackson, you can get him answering all your football questions, all your Packer questions by asking him through Ask. B Jack hashtag ask B Jack. Thanks a lot, guys, and appreciate you. Don't forget to tune in and follow us. We love you. Go pack, go. There is definitely an app that I'm now downloading. I can't wait to listen to you on Spreaker. Ben, any last words? I got everything I was really thinking out. Can't wait to get going on episode four. I can only imagine what the uh, title of that one's going to be. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a secret. Yeah. The roof is on fire. 
<laughs> oh, and one more thing. I, I don't. I won't get myself in trouble. You got to give my parent company some love. The Brawl Network. You hit them up on all the social medias at Network Brawl. Follow, like, and share the Brawl Network and the website, thebrawlnetwork.com. You can go there, sign up for free, and get all your football content there. I, I'll get myself in trouble if I don't drop them out. <laughs> we don't want that to happen. Again, Jay, thank you so much for coming on. And thank you so much, the listeners, for taking the time to listen to the podcast. It is truly appreciated. If you have a moment, please subscribe and, if possible, give us a rating and review. Also, remember to search for the Back Row Network of Shows for your other favorite teams wherever you download your podcasts. Interact with us on Twitter, at Yake and Bake, and at The Real Almanac, or with the show, at Back Row Pack. Until next time, go Pack Go. Go Pack Go.